In this video, we're going to introduce and begin exploring the distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous equilibria, and look at the difference between concentration-based and pressure-based equilibrium constants. We've seen that we can write the reaction quotient in terms of concentrations or pressures, but when it comes to equilibrium constants, using concentration versus using pressure leads to a different value. So we want to understand quantitatively how we can convert, quote unquote, from a concentration-based to a pressure-based equilibrium constant. But before getting there, let's talk about this distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous chemical equilibrium. In a homogeneous chemical equilibrium, the reactant and product uh, species are in a common phase, and this is typically a liquid solution, aqueous solution, for example, or a gas phase reaction where the reactants and products are all gases. In a heterogeneous equilibrium, which we'll explore later, some of the reactants or products might be pure solids or liquids alongside a solution or alongside a gas. So we've got a mixture of multiple phases, heterogeneous, right? Makes sense. Let's start with homogeneous equilibria first, though, because these are relatively simple to deal with since we're dealing with chemical species all in a single phase. To write equilibrium expressions or reaction quotients for these reactions, we just apply the ideas that we've seen previously, products over reactants, right, that basic idea. There is one important principle we need to introduce here, though, that's going to be especially important for heterogeneous equilibria, but can also apply to some homogeneous equilibria, as we'll see. We only include aqueous and gaseous species in the reaction quotient when we're re writing reaction quotients, and this is true of all chemical equilibria. The reason we do this is because the concentration, quote unquote, of a pure solid or liquid doesn't change as we generate it or consume it. That concentration is the inverse of the molar volume of that substance, which is a constant. It's an intensive property. And so thinking about those terms in the reaction quotient as ratios relative to a standard value, that ratio is always equal to one. And so we can essentially ignore pure solids and liquids since they'll appear as multiplying by one, quote unquote, in the reaction quotient. So we can ignore them entirely, and this makes our lives easier. Generally for homogeneous equilibria, because everything is in the same phase, we include all the reactants and all the products in the equilibrium expression or in the reaction quotient. There's one exception here. This first example is exactly what we're used to, products in the numerator, reactant concentrations in the denominator, as you see. In the second example, we have both products in the numerator of the reaction quotient, F minus and H3O plus, but only HF in the denominator. And this is because water, which is a reactant, is a pure liquid. And so we do not include it in the reaction quotient. Thinking about it as essentially multiplying by one, the reaction quotient. Now, this may look like a heterogeneous equilibrium because water is a liquid, but water is the solvent. And so water, HF, F minus, and H3O plus are all in a common phase of an aqueous solution. So technically, this is still a homogeneous equilibrium. We can also write reaction quotients for gas phase solutions, which are homogeneous. The ideas here are very similar. The only difference with these last two examples is that we have exponents that are not equal to one because we have stoichiometric coefficients that are not equal to one. So this is just a quick review of writing reaction quotients where we've introduced this new twist that we only include aqueous and gaseous species in reaction quotients. Pure solids and pure liquids, such as liquid water, are omitted. We saw in a previous video that we can think about the reaction quotient in terms of concentrations or partial pressures, and those are directly proportional to one another if we're talking about gas phase reactions, thanks to the ideal gas model. So we could write K, for example, in two different ways as the concentration of B to the Y power divided by the concentration of A to the X power, or in terms of the partial pressures of B and A, P sub B to the Y power divided by P sub A to the X power. And these are all, of course, at equilibrium since we're thinking about this ratio as equal to K. But of course, these values will be different, right? Since numerically, the molarity and the partial pressure of B and A are not equal to each other. So there's some relationship between K sub C and K sub P, the concentration and pressure-based equilibrium constants here. And this relationship has a consistent mathematical form that we can derive relatively straightforwardly. And that's what we're going to do now. 
The first thing I'm going to do, and this will make our lives easier later, is to find the change in the moles of gas in the reaction as delta n. And if we've got a balanced equation, x moles of A going to y moles of B and everything is gas, this is equal to y minus x. More generally, this is the moles of gas on the product side minus the moles of gas on the reactant side. So we're going to go ahead and define that, and we're going to use an idea from the ideal gas law that the partial pressure of a gas, let's call that gas I, is equal to R times T times the molarity of that gas, I in square brackets. And this follows from the ideal gas law. Now the thing we can notice is that we can apply this relation to the partial pressures P sub B and P sub A to get expressions in that second equation with K sub P that include the concentrations, the molarities of B and A. When we do that, we get quantity RT to the Y power times the molarity of B to the Y power divided by the quantity RT to the X power times the concentration of A to the X power. Now what we can notice is that this ratio is equal to the concentration-based equilibrium constant. So we can simply plug in K or K sub C as we've been calling it for that ratio and we can collect the RT terms into a quantity RT to the Y minus X power term and the result we get is quantity RT to the Y minus X power times K or KC is equal to KP. Now Y minus X, well that's what we previously defined as delta N and so the final result is that K sub P is equal to K sub C times RT to the delta N power. We can also rearrange things a little bit, isolating K or, or K sub C, and write that K sub C is equal to K sub P times quantity RT to the negative delta N power. Just got this by dividing both sides by quantity RT to the delta N power. So now we have an equation, a relationship, that allows us to calculate K sub P from K sub C, or vice versa, allowing us to determine pressure-based equilibrium constants if we know a concentration-based one, and vice versa. Pretty straightforward. In this practice problem, we're asked to write equations that relate K sub C to K sub P for each of the following reactions. And what we're going to do here is apply these equations that we derived on the last slide. So I've got the two versions in purple and black, an equation that allows us to calculate KC from KP, that's in purple, and an equation that allows us to calculate KP from KC, and that's in black. All we need to do in each case is determine the value of delta N, the change in moles of gas, for each reaction and essentially plug that into these equations to find the appropriate relationship. So for example in the first case we've got two moles of gas on the product side and one on the reactant side. Delta N is equal to 1. This means that K sub P is equal to K sub C times RT or in purple K sub C is equal to K sub P divided by RT or times RT to the negative 1 power. In the second case we have a delta N of zero, two moles of gas on the product side and two moles of gas on the reactant side. And so here, KC and KP are numerically equal. There's an RT to the zero power term here, and so KP and KC are equal to each other in value. Essentially, the RT terms divide out here, which is nice. In the third case, we have a delta N of negative two, and be careful to carry that negative sign around in the right way as you apply these equations. So, for example, K sub P is equal to K sub C times the quantity RT to the negative 2 power. That's the equation in black. And the version that allows us to calculate K sub C, K sub C is equal to K sub P RT squared in purple there. Those general equations are all well and good. We can also use those to calculate actual values. And that's what we're asked to do here. Calculate K sub P from a concentration-based equilibrium constant of 0.28 for the reaction below at 900 degrees C. And anytime you're doing this concentration-based, pressure-based sort of interconversion, a good first step is to determine the change in moles of gas going from reactants to products. And here that change is negative 2, and we can deduce that from the stoichiometric coefficients. We've got 3 moles of gas on the product side and 5 on the reactant side, so delta N is equal to negative 2. And so we can plug that in for the value of delta N, and we can plug in our known value of KC from the problem statement, and we get this equation, 0.28 times RT to the negative 2 power is equal to K sub P. And now what we need to do is plug in values for R and T. The temperature should be in Kelvin, so I've gone ahead and converted that, 1173 Kelvin. 
there, it corresponds to 900 degrees Celsius. And for R, we're going to use the value 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per Kelvin mole. And why we use the specific value will become clear very shortly. But for the time being, just trust me on this. We'll plug in those values and calculate things out. And when we do, we arrive at a value for K sub P of 3.0 times 10 to the negative fifth power. Now, why are we using liter atmospheres per Kelvin mole as the units of R in this case? Well, thinking about this on a somewhat deeper level, the units of R need to include our standard units of concentration and partial pressure that show up in reaction quotients. And we know from previous discussions, these are moles per liter for concentrations and atmospheres for partial pressures. And R has to include these units to ensure that we get proper dividing out, so on and so forth, when we're applying this relation in black between Kp and Kc. And notice that if we write the value of R and the units of R in a slightly different way, we see that this version of R does include those units. Atmospheres directly, and we can think of liters per mole as the reciprocal or inverse of molarity, and so molarity appears there as well. And of course, Kelvin appears as well, and this is why we need to use Kelvin inside the um, RT expression in this equation. 